Welcome to the latest episode of our podcast series for financial advisors. Today's episode is Advisor Turned CEO, How a $2.4 Billion Ameriprise Firm Cracked the Growth Code. It's a conversation with John Cutton, CEO of Cutton Wealth Management and Lewis Diamond. I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is Mindy Diamond on Independence. This podcast is available on our website, diamond-consultants.com, and on advisorhub.com, as well as Apple Podcasts and other major podcast platforms. If you are not already a subscriber and want to be notified of new show releases, please subscribe right on your favorite podcast platform or on the episode page on our website. And if you find the content in this series to be useful and know others who could benefit from it, feel free to share it widely. Building a successful business is no easy feat, especially if you're the one leading the charge, as well as working on the day-to-day tasks to move the ball forward. No doubt, many advisors often find themselves wearing several hats. Our guest on today's show was once in that same position. John Cutton, CEO of Cutton Wealth Management, entered the financial services industry while he was a junior in SUNY through an internship with IDS, the precursor to Ameriprise Financial. By the time he graduated, he had two licenses completed. His early success, which he credits to two advisors who served as his mentors and a lot of hard work, led him to get involved in mentoring others. 26 years later, John has built a 60-person independent Ameriprise firm managing some $2.4 billion in assets derived primarily by organic means through an alliance with the CPA, which developed into a game-changing referral engine. So it comes as no surprise that John has many industry accolades under his belt, including Barron's Top 100 Advisors List, Barron's Hall of Fame Advisor, Forbes Best in State, as well as being named the top producing advisor on the Ameriprise platform. And the list goes on and on. Yet accolades aside, John realized that if he wanted to build a business designed for growth, he needed to change his focus from working in the business to working on it. So he transitioned his role from client-facing advisor to CEO, a change that he felt was an imperative to take the business to the next level. You might say that John cracked the code on growth, developing processes designed to continuously create scale. And now he has his sights set on strategic recruiting and acquisition practices to drive the firm forward and ultimately build a legacy. As John puts it, the firm is now fishing with a net instead of a pole. And it's focused growth strategies like these that John also shares with other advisors through his consulting practice. Lewis Diamond takes the mic on this episode to dig into the details of how John's strategic plan is designed, the impact of his unique referral engine, the role that Ameriprise plays in his firm's growth, and why he feels that serving as the firm's CEO was the right move at the right time. Plus, he shares an inside perspective on independence, the evolution of Ameriprise over the years, and much more. It's an in-depth conversation with plenty of actionable information, and I'm going to let them get to it. John, honored to have you here today. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure, Lewis. Thanks for uh, for having me. Super excited and uh, a huge fan of the podcast. So congrats on uh, such a successful show. I appreciate that. Let's let's get started. Please just tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get to where you are today? Was Ameriprise your first stop after graduating from university? Yeah. So in actuality, it was. So back then, uh, Lewis, we were actually IDS Financial Services, which, as you know, turned into American Express Financial Advisors and now, of course, Ameriprise. So I've stayed in the same spot, but wore, I guess, uh, three different hats. And interesting fact is I actually started while I was a junior in college. So 
I interned where I went to college up at State University of New York in Albany, upstate and quite cold. And by the time I graduated, I had already had uh, two of my licenses done and was blessed to have interned with a couple of really successful uh, advisors, but more importantly, really good mentors. And the rest, as they say, is history. I've now sat in the same chair since 94 when I was formally appointed. That's amazing. That's a long time at one firm, especially in this day and age. Um, clearly, it's Meriprise has been a great partner for you. Walk us a little bit through your journey. How did you come to be one of the top five largest practices within the entire Ameriprise system and also accumulate so many accolades as such as the Barron's List, the Barron's Hall of Fame advisor, and every other industry list under the sun seems to recognize you as a top practitioner too. So tell us a little bit about your business, how much in assets are you managing, et cetera. Great question. And obviously 26 years, a lot of steps uh, to get there. So let me, let me kind of first start with the last question you asked. So today um, we're right around 2.4 billion or so of assets under management as a firm. And there's almost 60 of us in the organization. So we've got uh, roughly 18 advisors on the team in total, 12 junior advisors, or what we refer to as associate advisors, and then the balance of the team all in, there's uh, almost 60 people. So are either licensed power planners, administrative support. And then interestingly, and you know, we might get into this a little bit later, we've got six folks in the organization today that all they really do for the firm uh, is business development and support our professional alliance program, which is a, you know, a big piece of our business. So that's where we are today. In 94, when you kind of think about how we got started, I started right out of college. And back then, you know, we built the business kind of the old fashioned way, you know, with a, a lead program that we were offered and kind of hitting the phones and, you know, sitting at a lot of, a lot of kitchen tables with a lot of dogs eating at my shoes, so to speak. So we built it organically, then got involved in seminars and uh, kind of all the traditional ways to build the business. I would say, Lewis, what's a little bit different probably about my career path is um, I had some early success as a young guy in the business, and I got kind of that proverbial tap on the shoulder and got asked to get involved in mentoring other advisors. So I became what was called a training manager, which led to a district manager position, uh, and then ultimately what was at the time at least called an associate vice president. So, you know, to make a, a very long story short, I was extremely blessed to have unbelievable mentors and leaders who are still friends and mentors kind of to this day. Um, and I owe a lot of my success to actually learning and developing leadership skills, I think, early on. To fast forward, I spent about seven or eight years in leadership. At the time, American Express Financial Advisors went through a change and allowed advisors to either be employees of the firm or franchise owners, or as most would think of it, independent advisors. So I stuck in my leadership role for about a year after that optionality came about. Uh, and I realized that a lot of the guys and gals that I grew up in, in the business or mentored for that matter, were seeming to have a lot of fun, um, having a lot of success and financially uh, being really successful on the independent side. So I decided to actually join the independent channel. I think it was in 2001. And it was me at the time. I was able to, as a leader, still maintain a small book of business. So in 01, I went independent with about 35 million or so of assets under management. And at the time, probably 80% of my time was being spent leading others, not necessarily working with clients. And myself and a, at the time, a young man whose name is Evan Brampman, who's still with me today and actually runs a team that manages about 700 million uh, of the firm's assets. Uh, Evan and I, it was just the two of us, and we worked in what I would call the mezzanine level of my home. Um, you, Lewis, might call it my basement. So we finished my basement. We worked out of the basement. And um, to make a long story short, we can get into some of these details. I thought it would be smarter to, as we built the business from everything that I was able to see from how other successful advisors grew, it had a lot to do with how to consistently be able to bring new prospects into the office. 
And I thought partnering with CPA firms would be a smart thing to do, kind of you know, learn how to fish with a net as opposed to, the, to a pole. And we built our first CPA relationship in 2001. We still have a partnership, a really profitable and great partnership uh, with that firm today. And um, if you fast forward today, we, we work with almost 65 CPA firms here, mostly in the New York area and kind of spreading that out regionally as the firm continues to expand. And the rest, as they say, is history. That led to some practice acquisitions and really building you know, a culture of helping advisors grow and kind of thrive within our system. That's amazing. But look, can we jump off from the CPA comment? Because a lot of advisors, whether they are in a captive wirehouse environment, they're independent, they run on their own RIA, they've built um, or try to build um, center of influence referral networks. But typically, it doesn't seem to be as formal or as prolific as what you described. Um, can you just walk us through a little bit about how those alliances work. Um, 65 CPA firms is obviously a major number. How much in assets does it drive to your firm and what tips would you give to someone who was looking to establish a similar program for their organization? Yeah, no, great question. And um, yeah, so those 65 relationships, kind of giving you rough numbers, about 40 of those 60 relationships are real partnerships where we're in kind of a revenue sharing relationship or a solicitor agreement with a CPA firm. In essence, we become kind of their back office or their outsourced you know, firm that they actually will refer wealth management to. We become a resource to all of their clients. And the other 25 or so are more informal, kind of a, you know, a handshake, and they appreciate the type of work that we do for our clients and want to provide value not interested in the partnership, but just simply interested in doing more for their existing clientele. And so when you think from a client acquisition and asset perspective, um, we drive somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 to 250 new clients per year. This was a slow year for us with COVID and everything that went on. So we're close to that 150 new client perspective, but most years we're, we're right around 250 or so. And a good year for us is North of $100 million of new assets won on an annual basis. So it's a big part of our business and a big part of our growth for sure. But with that being said, we've learned over the years that it has to become systematized and it has to become process driven. So, you know, Lewis, I think, you know, um, outside of my practice, I actually uh, have a consulting company that helps advisors build relationships with CPAs. And, you know, as part of uh, that organization, I've got two things that I say over and over in my coaching. The first is working with CPAs is not a sprint, but it's a marathon. So like any relationship, it takes time. And what I believe is most advisors give up because it is hard and it does take you know more time than most people have patience for. So we sometimes talk about a term in the practice, we call it eat now versus eat later marketing, which if you just think about it simply, most advisors put most of their energy into activities that they can do today to drive a client, say, you know, 30 days down the road or two weeks down the road. So examples might be asking for a referral, hosting a client event, joining a networking group, doing a seminar, you know, things along those lines, immediate gratification. And that's what most advisors spend most of their energy on. To me, eat later marketing is putting a lot of time and energy into something that might take six months, nine months, 18 months to build a relationship. But the nice part about it, when you think about it in the kind of professional alliance world, is once you build that relationship, it will provide client acquisition as long as you handle that relationship the right way for many years to come, if not your entire career. So, you know, just a reference, I mentioned the first CPA firm we started to work with in 01, our joint book of business is right around 100 million of assets under management. And since 01, we've averaged about a dozen new clients per year coming from the CPA firm to our firm. So you know, if you think about that, since 01, I've been able to count on 12 new clients a year, being able to come into my practice and really put 
client acquisition a little bit on autopilot. So, you know, those would be some of the pieces. The only other thing I would just add there is the hard part about working with accountants in general or, or centers of influence is getting them to yes, right? The hard part is getting them to see value in what you do as a professional and how it could benefit and deepen their relationships with their clients. That's the hard part is getting them to yes. The harder part is actually then having the leadership skills so that you can influence that professional to do what it is that you want them to do, which is make introductions to their clients and kind of get what I like to call borrowed trust right? The accountant has the trust. That's why we're 90% plus when we meet a prospect from a CPA is because we're borrowing the trust and the goodwill that the CPA has to transition it to our firm. So I know that was a long answer, but as you can probably tell, I'm kind of passionate around it and it's fueled a lot of the growth of our business. And I've seen a lot of advisors who can figure that out, really just change the trajectory of their practices. No, thank you for sharing that. That is ridiculously helpful. And I mean, the, the results speak for themselves. But even just thinking about the ways in which most advisors would go about bringing in business, I love the concept of the eat now versus eat later marketing. It's very similar to the way that our business is built, where it's about developing relationships, investing in content and long-term trust, and then the expectation or the, the hope that if you do the right things by people, the results follow. And it, it is tough, I can imagine, for some of your your younger advisors who are just getting up and running to focus more on the long-term value creation versus the short term. And I think many, many of our listeners can benefit from what you just described on the, the CPA side. It seems like if you can execute it properly, it's a true win-win. Obviously, you're driving revenue and assets to your firm. You can bolster your pitch to clients as to what services you offer. And then on the CPA side, you take you're able to deliver recurring revenue to them, and it just bolsters their value proposition. So it seems like if you invest the right amount of time and you do it properly and you go slowly, that it could be a really meaningful part of a business and take away the days of cold calling and doing seminars in replacement of referrals from a trusted industry partner. Yeah, extremely well said. And um, I think you know what you're describing, we call the laws of reciprocity, right? If you do something well and educating someone or helping a client or providing a referral usually if you give someone a choice between asking for help and giving help usually people prefer to help right than to ask for it so people yeah. are really helpful when you can be valuable for sure and you know just to add a thought lewis one of our keys which i think might be interesting to your listeners is as they're thinking about kind of how to scale their business and um, become you know more attractive to advisors in the industry who might want to join their firms. One of the things that we've worked really hard on doing is how do we help advisors kind of get in the right seat on the bus, right? So, you know, what I mean when I say that is I always categorize financial advisors as usually either finders, minders, or grinders. And most advisors these days aren't so much grinders. But you know, the way I think about it, finders are the folks in the industry that generally are you know, growing the largest books of business and are having a lot of success. The reality of it is, is it's probably the top 5% of our industry that are really naturally gifted and good at and enjoy kind of the finding business, the business development side. I think most advisors in our industry are actually really good minders. They care greatly about their clients. They want to give an unbelievable client experience and provide value and help clients achieve their goals. And then grinders are the folks doing all the hard work, right? Writing the financial plans and making trades and making sure that, you know, meetings are prepared properly and you're kind of doing all that back office type work, which is super important uh, and valuable. And what we've really focused on is putting people in the right roles and separating within the business, right? So we've got advisors that we believe are unbelievable uh, at providing advice, building deep, meaningful relationships with clients, and providing an unbelievable you know, client experience that ultimately drives organic growth. If you could put an advisor in that chair and let he or she do what they're naturally gifted at and enjoy doing, they'll become unbelievably good at that. 
Same is true if you have someone who loves to hunt and goes out and, you know, speak at events and build relationships with professional alliances and network, et cetera. If you put that individual in a role that that's all they need to do, they're going to thrive as well. I think that's one of the issues lots of advisors have an issue with in scaling their business is they're forced to do all three of those roles, or at least two of them in most cases. And it's really hard to be great at more than one thing, as, as I think uh, most people would agree. Absolutely. And it also speaks to the benefits of scale, because most firms in the industry don't necessarily have the benefit of separating out the finding and the minding because they don't necessarily have the capital or the, the revenue base to justify splitting the roles. So I'm sure that's part of the pitch that you have for advisors joining your organization is focus on your unique ability, what you're best at, and let us do the rest. And I, I think that's great. A really, really interesting way to look at it. And it kind of moves in, us into our next segment. One of the things I was most fascinated to talk with you about, John, was the fact that you made the really difficult decision a couple of years ago to take off the, the finder hat, the lead advisor hat, something you were naturally gifted at and probably loved, but move into the role of a full-time CEO. So to hand off, presumably, a number of client relationships, step out of what you were comfortable with, and then focus more on operating the business. Can you describe to us that thought pattern? And it's a really important topic because so many financial advisors, no matter where they practice, really struggle with this concept, especially if they're captive at a wirehouse. They might be running a business and they're the CEO of their book, but they haven't necessarily ran a true business. And oftentimes we see that advisors who are incredible rainmakers and business developers and advisors, they sometimes either stumble in being a CEO or they just may not enjoy it. So I'm really curious to hear your thoughts around this and how you would counsel someone who was considering the same thing. Yeah, no, great question. I've got a lot to say on that subject. And my belief is, and I, I you know, coach a fair share of advisors outside of my practice and obviously been around the industry for quite some time. I'm big on sayings, right? What got you here won't get you there. And, you know, my belief is lots of advisors, you know, depending on the type of clientele that you are able to attract, right? The higher the net worth, probably the larger the revenue number here. But what I found is a good finder without putting that CEO hat on usually can you know run a business to somewhere between call it a million to 2 million a year in revenue. And then it gets really difficult to grow beyond that. And lots of advisors get stuck if they don't kind of change their role. So, you know, I read an amazing book. I can't tell you exactly how long ago, but it was quite some time ago by a, a gentleman by the name of, and you, you may have heard of him, Philip Palaviv. And he wrote a book called The Ensemble Practice, which I recommend everyone listen to, uh, or I should say read. And the thesis of the book, there's lots of great information in there, but my biggest takeaway reading that book was that the average income of a financial advisor is about $100,000 to $150,000 annually, if you think about that from a national perspective. Now, of course, lots of the listeners make significantly more than that because they're significantly better than average generally as a finder, right? As someone who can you know, uh, do business development and bring assets into a firm, et cetera. So my takeaway from that and where I kind of had this epiphany was when I thought about the work that I was doing and how I was helping my clients when I was still a practitioner, because quite frankly, I haven't worked with clients at all for a little over nine years right now. What I realized is someone who might have 10 years of experience or even less than 10 years of experience for a very typical kind of mass affluent, which I define as that 500,000 to a few million of investable assets, uh, an advisor with a lot less experience than me can help that typical client without my involvement, right? And if I wanted to actually scale a company and build a, a, an enterprise, the way to do that was to really focus on the vision of what it is that we were trying to build which quite frankly was how do we help as many human beings as possible in our target market, ultimately with their retirement and their kids' college and estate needs, et cetera. 
And I couldn't do that if I spent my life doing 14 or 15 or 16 meetings a week with my own clientele. So when I was able to kind of think through that a little bit, I quickly decided that you know the smartest thing for me to do to really scale the business was to put people in these kind of separate roles and let them do what they're naturally good at. So that was kind of a big part to the growth that we've had as a firm. And I'll just share, you know, Lewis, one of the ways that I really realized this um, even earlier in my career, and I continue to be a practitioner after this, was I had the opportunity to actually acquire a book of business. This goes back in, I believe it was 02. And you know, one of the things I could should share is I'm happily married for 23 years. I've got four sons. So if you go back to 02, my oldest just turned 21. My littlest guy is 14. And I've got two in between. My wife was very pregnant with our third son in 02. And the acquisition that I had an opportunity to, to purchase I live here in New York, out in Long Island, and the acquisition was actually in New Jersey, which I know you know fairly well. And to get from Long Island to New Jersey, you've got to go over this bridge called the George Washington Bridge, which is no fun feat for those of you uh, here on the East Coast. So I knew that buying that business wasn't the best thing for my family, but I also knew that it was the best thing for my practice. And what I did, Lewis, was at the time, Evan, who I mentioned earlier, in the podcast was probably about four or five years in the business, fully licensed, really my junior guy. I bought the business. I got Evan up to speed really quickly on how to serve clients. I helped him. I took some trips with him. I helped with the process. But to make a very long story short, Evan did an amazing job. The retention on the acquisition was 99%. He gave great advice, grew the book of business, And right there, what I realized was I didn't need to do everything in the practice. And I needed more folks like Evan that I could put into positions so that they can thrive and do what they're naturally good at. So I know I blabbered there a little bit, but um, it's really, in, in my opinion, important that you start to kind of step back as you're looking to scale a business and think about how you can work, not necessarily in the business full time, but spend more of your time working on it. Clearly you have a gift for the coaching side too, because I think most business coaches would try to preach a similar topic to focus on one's unique ability, the things that drive them and excite them and to hand off either the lower value tasks or something that someone else is really good at. I've gotten the question a number of times about, is there a AUM number or a revenue annual revenue figure where it makes sense to step out of the advisor role into the CEO role or to hire a professional CEO if if the lead advisor prefers to stay in the advisor seat? Yeah, really good question. I would say to really start to scale the business, when I was I, I think I waited longer than I needed to, and put it that way. But I really began to stop seeing clients when the business was doing about 5 million or so in revenue. So probably five, 600 million of assets under management. If I had it all to do over again, I would have actually done it much earlier uh, in, you know, in my career. So every practice is different. And I think a lot of it has to do with what you want for yourself, right? So I've got, you know, friends of mine in the industry who run amazing businesses that have great lifestyles and are running, you know, I guess what the industry calls lifestyle practices. And every once in a while I think about them and I'm like, man, that that wouldn't wouldn't have been so bad either. So I think a lot of it has to do with what it is, you know, you ultimately want for yourself. For me, I wanted to scale a great big business. I like leading advisors and my staff and building a culture. You know, I get more satisfaction out of that than helping you know a couple of hundred clients achieve their financial goals personally. So I don't know if that's the answer that you were looking for there, but I think it's a little different you know for each and every practitioner out there. Yeah, that's terrific. Thank you. And I think the five million mark just kind of feels right. Obviously, most practices don't reach the five million dollar number, and you have plenty where they're smaller but have hired a professional CEO or have hire junior advisors to take on some of the day-to-day, but that, that is a helpful perspective. Let's, um, let's keep marching forward here. 
if you were coaching a younger advisor, either one that was an employee of your firm or someone you met at a at an Ameriprise conference or a an industry event, and they asked you, how do I grow a billion dollar practice like you have? What would be the two or three pieces of advice you would offer? Really good question. And, and it's an interesting one because I've got, you know, two college age sons. So also thinking through how to how to lead them as well. So I would say three things that come to mind. One would be you actually have to work really hard, right? So there are no gifts. I worked unbelievably hard and still do today for a lot of years. You have to put your time in. There are no shortcuts. I, in today's environment, would certainly lean towards picking a mentor as opposed to going at it on my own, right? So I think joining a team that's got the right vision, the right culture, and mentors, many mentors within it that can help develop you as a young professional and kind of show you the way. I believe teams are going to get bigger and bigger. There'll be more and more scale and the largest practices in the country are going to continue to get larger. And if you can seek out the right mentors, that's how you ultimately get where you want to go. I think it's really hard. When I started in 94, you could hit the telephone and do seminars and work really hard and build the business. Not to say it's impossible today, but I think it's a lot more difficult than the way most of us built it you know, back in the day. So that would be one piece. The second piece is I would take a more entrepreneurial mindset to it. So, um, you know, I look at a lot of the growth that I've been able to have in my business. As, as you look at a lot of the top practices in the country on the independent side, a lot of that growth is coming through making intelligent investments into a practice, whether that be in human capital, whether it be in building out lead magnets like professional alliances and things along those lines, social media, getting really good at something that can bring clients in. And the third would be to invest early and often in your business. So the best advice I probably got in my entire career was in 1994. And I stick to this today. And the advice was to save 20% of whatever you make from every paycheck. And I've literally done that since 1994 and built a fair amount of liquid wealth, which has allowed me to make these intelligent investments in people and also uh, more recently in inorganic growth strategies like acquisitions and bringing in experienced advisors to continue to build that talent. So I think a lot of advisors and a lot of folks in general, we see this with our clients, right? Become affluent, meaning they make a good living, but there's not an awful lot of money of liquidity in their bank account ready to be invested when the opportunity comes along. So I'd say save, live beneath your means, and the other two kind of pieces that were important. Uh, I think if you follow that model of mentorship, um, living beneath your means and really just being a sponge, um, you can you know, quickly, quickly scale a really successful and profitable practice. Well said. Thank you very much. And I think many advisors would thank you too for that sage advice. And let's talk a little bit about your relationship with Ameriprise. The company has changed like most, um, but I think Ameriprise especially pretty dramatically. The culture has changed. Its reputation and standing in the industry has certainly um, changed in a real positive way since you joined back in, in the early to mid 90s. Can you explain a little bit just what this evolution has meant and tangibly what it's meant from the advisor standpoint and what these changes have done for you? Yeah, I I think being here since 94, I mean, the amount of change has been unbelievable. And it's interesting, Lewis, you know, I I meet lots of advisors in the industry and we're out, you know, adding folks to our organization, of course, as well. I think there's a misnomer. I think uh, lots of folks really don't understand who Ameriprise is today and they think of the company from the you know late 90s and early 2000s, et cetera. So, you know, I would share, interestingly enough, with COVID, we, um, you know, my wife has been nesting. So she went through and, you know, cleaned out some of the storage rooms in the house and stuff. And uh, she just uncovered, it was my, my birthday last week, by the way. And my wife actually uncovered two things. One was from 1994, 
the letter of recommendation on you know IDS, which was our predecessor company's name, uh, letterhead that the person I interned for wrote, uh, who I actually happened to reach out to last week and, and sent him a copy of it, which was kind of interesting. And the second thing that she actually uncovered was a brochure from IDS Financial Services, which Lewis listed six mutual funds that we offered at the time, right? So six mutual funds was our, our basically product pool. So as you fast forward today, Meriprise is one of the largest independent broker dealers uh, in the country. I think number two on headcount. Our average advisor productivity is up there with the very best independent firms in the country as well. And our clientele has moved up market big time. We, we actually specialize at, you know, at Ameriprise in what I call the five to five space, which is a half million uh, to five million of investable assets. Sure, lots of clients have a little less. Sure, many clients have significantly more, but we serve that high net worth space today quite well. And I could share, I don't think I could have said that in full transparency, probably seven or eight years ago with the level of confidence that I, I do today. And then I get asked a lot, you know, just to be very transparent, why do I stay, right? So we've got at the moment, one of the top two largest businesses uh, in the Ameriprise ecosystem. And, you know, I stay for a lot of reasons, right? While the economics could likely be better in the RIA space and maybe even some other independent broker dealers and the, the platform, right? Which I think is very robust. Um, it doesn't have everything that I would always dream of from exotic products and things along those lines. There is absolutely everything on the shelves and in the ecosystem. Do an unbelievably good job for your clients. Most importantly to me, Lewis, the culture is amazing. And I believe, you know, that's a big part of the missing ingredient in some of um, kind of our industry today, the level of culture the level of having a systematic way of delivering advice, and most importantly, delivering a real, tangible client experience driven through technology and driven through really all of the tools that we need to simplify how to run a practice and to simplify the client experience is absolutely amazing. So that would be my thought. And I do think it's a very misunderstood firm. And, you know, I've brought on probably a half dozen quality advisors over the last year or so. And as they all got under the hood, they were unbelievably impressed and in some cases surprised about just, just everything that the broker dealer offers. Yeah, that definitely jives with what we are seeing as well. When advisors take a long, hard look at the firm, um, it's, there's definitely some things that are pretty special about the culture and what advisors are able to do for their clients. How about some more of your of your advice we'll be looking for here? Wirehouse advisors or really any advisor who's looking out at the independent space has more options than ever. It's really exciting for advisors because choice drives everything. It gives them more leverage and it enhances their ability to find the most ideal solution for themselves and their clients. But it could be somewhat overwhelming. So the options range from starting your own RIA for the extremely entrepreneurial do-it-yourselfers to leveraging a supported or turnkey independent platform. You can join a, a broker dealer as an independent contractor, such as Ameriprise or Raymond James. So a lot of choices. How would you counsel an advisor considering their independent options? Yeah, another awesome question. You know, I am a big believer uh, in independence. I'm biased because I've been independent for quite some time. I would prefer to choose how I invest the profits of my practice um, into my own business and make decisions that I think are the right thing for my clients and for myself and the folks who work in the organization. So I'm a big advocate of independence for sure. And as I think about the decision making, I believe that for the most part, just like we would tell one of our clients, broker dealers or the RIA space for the most part, are commoditized, right? Just like, in my opinion, our industry is moving more towards clients paying us for intellectual capital as opposed to for investment performance only, right? And all the competition uh, we have out there from robos and other sources, et cetera. So I look at it the same way. I think if you line up 
the RIA world, the different various independent broker dealer worlds, I think they all start to look a lot alike. And I think if you if you think about it from a product availability perspective, where you can best serve your clients, and if you think about it from an economic perspective as to what it means to your practice in the firm of profits and revenue and costs, et cetera, I think you can kind of pick your broker dealer, your independent broker dealer, your RIA. And I think they're all very close to each other. If I was an advisor looking to change where I sit today, I would really be focusing on a couple of things. One is where will I grow quickest, right? Where do I have an opportunity to actually join an organization that will help me scale and grow my business and ultimately bring more new money into my practice? I think a lot of advisors look at this as a financial decision. Where's my payout rate going to be best on a net basis? Will I pick up equity in my practice, right? Um, how do I make more from the same clientele that I have today? And I think that there's such a little disparity between firms. You can kind of you know, choose any of them and you'll probably get to a pretty good spot. I really think it's about who's going to actually help you grow quickest. And uh, you know, I'm probably a little biased here, but what I could share with you is I've seen some statistics that basically show that advisors at Ameriprise as a broker dealer actually grow at about an 8% CAGR, compound annual growth rate per year, where in the industry, that CAGR is about 3%. So what I would tell you to do as an advisor is to take your production level today, let's say it's a million, run it over the next 10 years at 3%, run it over the next 10 years at 8%, and see what that means in economics to the bottom line of your practice and to the growth of your business And then I believe that there's lots of opportunities out there. I think my firm is one of them. And there's lots of large independents and RIAs that just provide a very different value proposition that will take supported independents to a whole nother level. And that's really what we've tried to focus on building in our firm is how do we actually, as a firm, provide opportunities to plug advisors into So we bring in these hundreds of clients a year from CPA firms. We actually look to help the advisors onboard these clients where we actually build the CPA firm relationships and provide uh, clients to the advisors. When we do an acquisition, we try to plug one of our advisors into the acquisition. And I know there are other firms out there that do the same type of thing. So I would really be looking at it, Lewis, and going, not so much is it just a margin question, but how do I actually scale and grow my business quickly by adding more clients and having more support and resources around me to help me grow? Absolutely. And do you see any downsides with being at a broker dealer, whether it's from a product or a freedom and flexibility standpoint? Yeah. Listen, in, in all honesty, I think you can do an amazing job for your clients on the BD side, 100%. Otherwise, I wouldn't sit here on the broker dealer side. Are there, in certain circumstances, potentially less options um, in certain scenarios? Yeah. I, I think, obviously, if you are fully independent, you can make any decision that you'd like right from a plethora of choices that actually are out there in the industry. So there is a slight amount of limitation when you sit on a BD chassis. And I think the industry kind of knows that, but I really don't believe at all that that prevents an advisor uh, from giving an unbelievable experience and doing the very, very best for their clients. Definitely. Thank you for sharing that, John. You mentioned some of it in your your last reply, but a part of your firm's growth, your inorganic growth has been through acquisitions. What's the strategy there? And are the practices you're typically acquiring, are they already independent practices within the Ameriprise family? Or are they practices from an external source, whether different broker dealer, an existing RIA, or an advisor looking to retire or monetize from a wirehouse? Another great question. So the answer would be both. We've done acquisitions here internally within the Ameriprise ecosystem which I would share is one of the best pieces, in my opinion, about Ameriprise is we really understand equity value and practices generally sell for quite a premium relative to what they sell for outside of the ecosystem from uh, the due diligence that I've been able to do. So we've done uh, quite a few 
internal acquisitions. And we've also done quite a few external. So they come from both places for sure. And um, we've had a lot of success with both of those. A big part of our strategy as we kind of look at the future, Lewis, is we've got five main hubs right now, and we're looking to kind of expand that. We call them beachheads, right? So I'm working on an opportunity right now with an advisor coming from the wirehouse space. He's a roughly a million dollar producer and wants to grow and wants to join the independent world. So he's joining the team. And what we're going to help him do is take all of the things that we do within our practice which is our culture, leadership development, our systems, our processes, helping build CPA relationships, helping with future acquisitions, helping with tuck-ins of advisors and build out around him in partnership around his practice that he's bringing into the firm in his geographic area. So a big part of what we look to do is acquire practices in a region, find the right advisor whether it be internally here in Ameriprise or externally, which is where we've had most of our success, and bring he or she kind of into the family and teach them our system and process to build their own beachhead, which our goal is to ultimately have a dozen beachheads doing 10 million a year on average in revenue in 12 different locations around the country and having kind of practice leaders running that for the organization. Those are some lofty goals, but sounds like you're well on your way to to achieving it. And one last question on the acquisition side. First, I guess just to comment, it's I think it's a brilliant strategy to leverage the internal practices within Ameriprise as a hunting ground for your own acquisition strategy. I, I would agree with you that is a major competitive advantage of operating within a broker dealer is that it's very difficult for an advisor looking to sell or retire to justify transitioning. So typically they'll look first and foremost internally to find if there's a way to monetize their practice without needing to make the change. And clearly as one of the leading practices within the broker dealer and someone who's been there forever, using your resources um, appropriately is I think pretty brilliant and something that a lot of advisors can, can really learn from. Not so dissimilar from the advisor sitting on the Merrill or UBS platforms who have made a habit of being the successor to retiring advisors through those firms' retiring advisor programs. So I, I love it. You got to use what you have in front of you and make the best of it. So again, one last question on the acquisition side. I kind of just alluded to it. It is really hard to find advisors that are willing and able and excited to look at transitioning their book of business and their practice to a new broker dealer or a new platform before retirement and before selling the business. You mentioned you've done some acquisitions from the outside, from non-Ameriprise practices. Do you typically see more success on the internal side or do you kind of think differently that it's actually not that bad for advisors to repaper and if there's enough motivation, it's worth it? Yeah, they've both been uh, super successful. So we've been 98% or better average retention of clients both ways. So the Ameriprise ones are really simple. I mean, it's an amazing thing when you buy another Ameriprise advisor, a button is hit and their 20, 30 years of life work building a business is transitioned. And of course, there's a process to meet clients the proper way and ensure that clients are comfortable and and all that. But uh, our most recent external one was about a year ago. Um, An advisor came over from a wirehouse and he's a perfect example. We're working on probably three or four right now from wirehouse uh, advisors. So, you know, there's two things that drive, you know, an advisor's desire to go through succession planning, right? Or I should say two pieces to the decision. One is who is going to take best care of my clientele, right? Which I think is the most important one as an advisor. And I think if you as an advisor can build the right system process and delivery to clients and a great reputation, sometimes advisors just don't have a successor they feel comfortable with in their own location or in their current world. We find that a lot from the wirehouse world. And the second is economics, right? So, you know, the first is how do we best take care of our clients? What firm can do that? And the second is economics. And, you know, when you compare an independent valuation and the tax 
treatment of an acquisition relative to a sunset program, the economics just don't compare in my experience, right? So you got a couple of moving pieces. In my firm, when an advisor transitions over, there is some transition compensation or bonus for them to bring their book of business. So, you know, there's a monetization uh, event to bring the book of business from wherever it sits today over here to my firm. So there's some extra economics there. Uh, And then, you know, generally from a valuation perspective, we believe that wealth management practices on the independent space are generally going to be a five to six times EBITDA uh, number, depending on the size of it. I'm thinking, you know, of a smaller, call it a million dollar uh, ish practice in revenue or a three X recurring revenue type valuation. So if you're doing a million a year in revenue, there is going to be call it 40 to 60 percent transition compensation to bring a book of business over on average. Then there's going to be a 3x, let's say, $3 million price tag, of which the majority of that sale, if not all of it, would be cap gains treatment because it's a goodwill sale um, relative to the typical sunset program of taxable income and earn out and all that kind of good stuff. You do that math um, from our analysis, you know, it's usually 40% or so better of what the advisor ultimately puts in his or her pocket when all is said and done, which becomes very compelling and very creative. So that would be my best way of kind of wrapping that up, Lewis. I think it's a two-piece decision. Who's going to best serve your clients? That should be number one. And then as you get into the economics, I just think uh, there's a lot that could be left on the table by not at least looking at an independent uh, channel as an opportunity. Perfect. Great reply. Last question here as a wrap. What's next for your firm? Obviously, you're not going to be doing this forever. So have you begun to think about your next generation team, your next CEO? Um, and just in general, what are some things you're most excited for in the couple of years ahead? Yep. I just brought on a 23-year past the Ameriprise regional vice president who ran about 20% of the employee division for Ameriprise. He just actually became my president uh, and, and a partner of mine actually you know, bought a piece of the firm. And we also brought on a very experienced COO who came from the CPA advisor space with an incredible background as well. So we are beefing up our leadership team uh, for our continued growth for sure. And you know what's interesting, Lewis, is my goal is to build a legacy practice So I don't know that the day will come that I would look to sell the entire business to an external third party. I've got seven equity partners in the business today. And my goal long term is to have, you know, 50, 60, 100 equity partners. So when we've designed our compensation, we've got a career track that leads to equity ownership. And sometimes advisors who bring books of business get it right away, most of the times, uh, in fact. So it will likely be an internal succession plan. And my hope is that, you know, a couple of my boys, if not all of them, get into the business. And hopefully this thing, you know, outlives me, you know, for a couple hundred years and can help millions of people along the way with their financial goals. That's an amazing answer. Got to love the family business angle. A little biased there, but uh Good for you. I think that's every advisor's dream is to build an enduring business and one where it can pass from generation to generation. So just as a quick wrap, um, I would be remiss not to give you a little shout out for your new podcast series. So brief 30 second or less elevator pitch. What's the new podcast? What's the intent of it? And why would you decide to start it now? Thank you. A little shameless selling, I guess. So the name of the podcast is Quantum Growth for Financial Advisors which is a tagline that I've used in my coaching company for years. And, you know, Lewis, I don't say this to pat myself on the back, but I started at 21 and didn't come from much and, you know, have built a business that has exceeded my expectations. And I've, you know, really reached my financial goals. I just feel like I have a lot to share. So a lot of my success has been from mentors. And I've probably referenced a handful of times on today's podcast that I was lucky and fortunate enough to have great mentors in this business. And that's why I built what I built. And I still have a coach who coaches me and the whole firm. So I'm a big advocate of 
not recreating the wheel and really learning from others. So the whole purpose of the podcast is simple. I want to help advisors grow, learn from people that I've been lucky enough to have in my life about the opportunities and the options and how to build and scale a business and kind of learn from uh, the many mistakes that I've made along the way. So that's it. It's really to give back and hopefully provide value so advisors can get more of what they want for themselves. Fantastic. I will definitely tune in as, as long as you talk more about some of your management techniques and your visions on the business. I found those to be supremely helpful. So thank you so much for joining us today, sharing your wisdom and experience. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having me and um, continued success. And uh, I really appreciate being your guest today. So thanks again. John shared advice that is relevant to any advisor, whether you're working at a wirehouse or an independent business owner. For example, investing in yourself and your business through education and mentoring are two key areas that will pay off in droves. And while he attributes his growth to hard work, it's smart and strategic decision-making that are really driving his success. I thank you for listening. And I encourage you to visit our website, diamond-consultants.com, and click on the tools and resources link for valuable content. You'll also find a link to subscribe for regular updates to the series. And if you're not a recipient of our weekly email, Perspectives for Advisors, click on the blog link to browse recent articles. These written pieces are an ideal way to stay informed about what's going on in the wealth management industry without expending the energy that full-on exploration requires. Feel free to email or call me if you have specific questions. Lewis and I can be reached at 908-879-1002 and my cell is 973-476-8578 my email mdiamond at diamond-consultants.com. Please note that all requests are handled with complete discretion and confidentiality. And again, if you enjoyed this episode, feel free to share it with a colleague who might benefit from its content. And a special thanks to advisorhub.com for sharing this podcast with their viewers and subscribers. This is Mindy Diamond on Independence. Independence.